Good evening, Church History friends. My name is Barb Walden, and it is a joy to welcome you tonight to tonight's opening lecture in the Church History Without Boundaries Autumn Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's tradition here at the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation to take to the road every October on our annual bus tour. But this year, thanks to COVID-19, we're staying close to home for everyone's safety. Instead, we are traveling the world through the pages of church history. Even better, a number of fantastic historians, including tonight's speaker, have donated their time and knowledge to help share the stories behind Community of Christ's global roots. Each Thursday night until November 19th, we will explore a different part of the world as guest historians talk about church history that took place in places like Nigeria, Korea, India, Canada, England, and the Holy Land. It's going to be a great series and I couldn't be more thrilled to see how many of you are joining us this evening. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Our Church History Without Boundaries lecture series is not only a great way to spend a Thursday night learning church history, it's also a benefit for the Community of Christ historic sites. The sites are temporarily closed for public safety due to COVID-19, but the preservation and maintenance of the historic sites continues on even though they're closed. Your donations are especially critical as the loss of revenue from site preservation fees and museum store sales this year is unprecedented. As we continue to work towards the goal of becoming self-sustaining, your donations from tonight's lecture will help support and preserve Community of Christ historic sites for present and future generations. For those who like to make an online donation, you'll find the donations link in the chat box. You're also welcome to send a donation in the mail to the address also found in the chat box. Thank you for your generous consideration and for helping us preserve these places of church heritage. Now, the last person I want to introduce you to this evening is our wonderful guest speaker, Dr. John Charles Duffy. John Charles is a professor of American religious history with an earlier background in literary studies. With that combined background, he is interested in how histories are crafted akin to the way art and literature are crafted. He is a member of Community of Christ Sacred Stories ministry team. In fact, he may look familiar to our former interns as John Charles has taught a course for a number of years on history and meaning making for the summer interns at the Joseph Smith Historic Site in Nauvoo, Illinois. Tonight, John Charles will take a look at the challenge of developing a shared story in Community of Christ and he'll discuss the ongoing efforts to develop such a story and image within a global church family. His lecture this evening is entitled, A Global Family, Strategies for Visualizing and Narrating Community of Christ Global History. Thank you for joining us, John Charles. I'll hand the microphone over to you as we are all looking forward to hearing your thoughts on preserving and sharing Community of Christ Global History. Fantastic. Uh, Peter, a quick confirmation that you're seeing the presentation on the screen? Yes, we are good. Perfect. Great. So with today's presentation, I'm not going to be telling a story about the past. I'm going to be talking about how we tell stories about the past, and in particular, the challenges of trying to tell a global story about Community of Christ. For the past few years, I have been spearheading an effort to create a companion to a book that many of you may already be familiar with, which is Community of Christ and Illustrated History, produced by Barb and David Howlett and John Hamer. The, this project has been underway now for a few years. It was supposed to have been finished two years ago, and that hasn't happened yet, because this project proved to be rather more daunting than I had anticipated when I first started it. But the idea is to create a second book called Community of Christ, A Global Family. The illustrated history that Barb, David, and John wrote, like other longer treatments of Community of Christ history, whether we're talking about Inez Smith Davis's story of the church, 
or Mark Schur's Three Volume Journey of a People, focuses primarily on events happening in the US and secondarily on events happening elsewhere. Now, there are perfectly good reasons for doing that, including the fact that the church's headquarters have always been located in the US and the church's membership has always been located primarily in the US. Still, when you tell a story that focuses primarily on what's happening in the US, then inevitably events that are happening elsewhere get crowded out to the margins of our history. And they also get crowded out of our shared historical memory, the picture or the story that we all carry in our heads of who we are and what is our story. So the goal of this new book in process, Community of Christ, a global family, was to pull back from a focus centrally on the US to try to bring the margins, that is to say what's happening elsewhere into the world, more clearly into the picture. This goal was inspired by Doctrine and Covenants 161, which says, heed the urgent call to become a global family united in the name of the Christ. Becoming a global family, it seems to me, means that we need to have a very clear and vivid sense of ourselves as a global family. But I will admit that I don't have that clear, vivid sense of Community of Christ as a global family. I'm aware, of course, the Community of Christ is an international body. Um, but my life in Community of Christ is focused primarily on my local congregation, secondarily with connections that I have to church headquarters um, or to the church's historic sites and the historic community. But that's still very much a U.S.-centered kind of community. So in some ways, as I take on the task of producing this book, I'm trying to create for myself a clear story in my own head of who we are, not as a U.S.-centered church, though we are that, but trying to get a clear sense of who we are, more globally speaking. Now, writing a church history that is global in scope, even if it's going to be a very short illustrated book of about 100 pages, which is the goal, is a very challenging task. It's challenging, first of all, to gather all of the data that you need to produce such a history. But then there's also the challenge of taking all that raw historical data, all those records that give you some sense of what was happening in the past, taking all that material and then somehow shaping it into a manageable story, something that has a beginning, a middle, an end, something that has a plot, a thread that carries you through it, a story that will be complex enough to do justice to all of the historical data that you have, but at the same time will be simple enough that people can grasp it, they can follow it, and they can easily remember it and then retell it. I'm not entirely sure yet how to do that, but I do have a pretty clear sense of what I don't want to do. I don't want to produce something like this. What you're seeing in front of you is a document produced by the LDS Church, which is the church that I was raised in before I joined Community of Christ. Uh, it's a volume that they used to produce every year. I believe they've stopped producing it, but it was called the Church Almanac. And it contained, among other things, just raw data about the church's presence in different parts of the world. And it was alphabetized uh, alf it was organized alphabetically, like an encyclopedia. So you see here the entries for Marshall Islands, Mauritius, Mexico, and would have raw data on you know, how large the church is in that area, how many units, how many members, and a little bit about the history of the church in that particular nation. This is a very valuable kind of resource. It's a resource that I wish we had in Community of Christ because it would make my job a lot easier in trying to gather this kind of data. But I, this is not what I want to produce for the purposes of this short book, Community of Christ, a Global Family. That is to say, I don't want to produce a book that works you through the story of the church in every nation where we are found. The reason I don't want to do that is because that's not a story. It's a potentially useful source, but it tells you about the church here and here and here and here and here, but all those individual stories get siloed off separately. What I'm trying to figure out how to do is how to help us think of ourselves as a global family, as a body who are located in different parts of the world, but that means I have to figure out how to take the story or the stories of the church in different parts of the world and figure out how to weave them all together into a larger whole. 
So how do we do that? Well, because this is a church history, I've been spending some time thinking about theological frameworks that might be useful. That is to say, theoretical, theological perspectives on what all of this historical data about Community of Christ as an international body means. And so for that, I've been looking to Doctrine and Covenants especially. I mentioned already Doctrine and Covenants 161. Heed the urgent call to become a global family, united in the name of the Christ, committed in love to one another, seeking the kingdom for which you yearn and to which you have always been summoned. And so that raises a question for me as a historian. What is the story of how God has called us to become a global family? And what is the story of how we have responded to that call? I find inspiration in this passage from Doctrine and Covenants 163. God is calling for a prophetic community to emerge, drawn from the nations of the world, that is characterized by uncommon devotion to the compassion and peace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. As a historian, I read that and I ask myself, okay, so what is the story of how God has been drawing people from different nations of the world together to form a single faith community in the name of Jesus Christ. And then there's this from Doctrine and Covenants 165. More fully embody your oneness and equality in Jesus Christ. And again, I ask myself, okay, so what is the story of how community of Christ thus far in our history have embodied oneness and equality in Christ? And what is the story of how we have failed thus far to embody oneness and equality in Christ as well or as fully as God would like us to do? So those are some of the theological perspectives or frameworks that I'm using as I think about this project. In addition, I'm a very visual person, so I like to have models that I can picture in my head as I'm thinking about how I might structure a story about community of Christ as a global family. And there are a couple different models I have bouncing around in my head. One looks something like this. It's a model where you have the center place, and there are all kinds of things going out from that center place, information and people. And this is certainly a useful model for thinking about a lot that has happened within Community of Christ international history. It is, however, a model that I'm nervous about. Or maybe better put, I feel, I have very mixed feelings about this model. In one sense, I very much love this model. This idea of going out from the center into the world to carry out Christ's mission is one I find very inspiring. Um, it's a model that we find in the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, which is something that has been very important in shaping my sense of who I am as a disciple. The dedicatory prayer um, ask God to pour the spirit down on those who are in the temple so that they can go out empowered by the spirit to carry out God's work in the world. I like that image. Um, whenever I go to the community of Christ temple and in independence, I think about that image. I'm in this temple. I'm having an encounter with God that revives me spiritually so I can go back out into the world. So as a metaphor, I like this idea of going out from the center place. But when you take that metaphor and you map it literally onto geography, it becomes a problematic kind of model because it means that there's a certain place in the world that becomes the center. And there are the people who live in that place become central to the story and to the community. And then everything else by definition becomes the margins. And the nature of the relationship between center and margins is that the center is where there's more power. So a model of center and things going out from the center to the rest of the world is a problematic model because it means that it's a model where there's a power inequality embedded in it. So while this model certainly describes a lot of what has happened in our history, it's a model that I think we also need to be wary of. A model that I like more, which I came up with early in the process of conceiving this book, is in some ways the opposite. Instead of things going out from the center, it's a model of things being drawn into the center. So in this model, all those lines you see spiraling in toward 
the center should be thought of as streams of people, people from different nations or people from different ethnic backgrounds who are all being pulled in, as it were, by the gravitational force of God's grace until we are coming together, drawn together, as DNC 163 says, to become a prophetic people with the temple serving as the central symbol of that coming together. And I like this as a historian because it gets me thinking about the fact that every, every group, every nationality, every ethnicity who are drawn into our community come with their own backstory. And so you can start to think of the history of the church not as a single stream that people get plugged into over time, but as a whole series of stories. There's this story, the backstory that led to people in Haiti being brought into the church, the backstory that led to people in Britain being brought into the church, the backstory that led to people in India being brought into the church. That's a different way to start thinking about our history. It becomes a history that has multiple origins, but all of which then feed into this one community that God is in the process of forging us into. I like that model a lot, but it's a complicated model. It's hard to imagine how you weave that all into a single story. Then there's another model, which the previous two models both have a center. Things are either going out from the center or they're being drawn into the center. But there's another model I carry in my head, which is inspired by a woman named Cheka Okazaki. As I mentioned, I grew up in the LDS church. And in the, I think it was the early 1990s, Cheka Okazaki was one of the leaders of the LDS church's Relief Society. It's global organization for women. She's Japanese American. And she gave a sermon, which um, really stuck with me over the years, in which she used the metaphor of a cat's cradle. You see her holding it there on the cover of her book. Uh, the idea of a cat's cradle is a metaphor for thinking about how um, Christ weaves people together into community. And so as you look at the cat's cradle, you're supposed to imagine that all the different points on the cat's cradle are people, and we are all connected in this, this web of concern and love for one another. And Christ is weaving that pattern together. Uh, the cat's cradle model makes me think of the song we sing in Community of Christ, weave, weave, weave us together. I like that way of thinking about how it is that God draws us together into a global family. It's not about a center. It's about a much more complicated kind of web of relationships. I encountered, uh, as I was working on the research for this novel, a variation on that metaphor in a Herald article from back in the 90s written by David Brock called Connecting the Dots, in which he talks about being at a church conference in South Texas um, and looking around the room, and he starts to think about all the different kinds of connections that people in that room have to one another and all the connections that they have to people who are outside of that room but in community of Christ. And so as when you like when you connect the dots when you're you know doing that little kind of child's exercise he starts trying to connect the dots between people but it kind of branches out of this this complex network and web and by the time he's done doing it he's connecting people in that room in Wolasco, Texas to people in Okinawa or people in Kenya i mean this becomes this very complex kind of web of relationships around the world i like that as a metaphor but again it's hard to think about how do you how do you tell a story about a web that complicated? So I've got some guiding principles in mind as I think about how to tell this story. And let me walk you through some examples of how I would apply these principles. One is the idea of zooming out to the global level. So as I mentioned before, traditionally when we tell the story of the community of Christ, we focus centrally on the United States. I do this myself. As Barb mentioned, I teach a course for interns at the Joseph Smith Historic Site in Nauvoo every summer. And I talk about the early history of the Latter-day Saint movement leading up to Nauvoo. And I typically do that by placing the story of the saints in the larger context of U.S. history. And there are different ways you can do that. So we'll talk about how it is that the saints fit into the larger story of religious revival in the early 1800s in the United States, or how the story of the saints fits into the larger story of other kinds of religious tension and persecution in the U.S. during that period, including the persecution of Catholics. Or we'll talk about how the saints fit into the larger story of westward migration in U.S. history. So there are all these kinds of larger stories you can place the saints in, in the context of U.S. history. And as a historian of American religion, I'm used to doing that. The bigger challenge is 
if you've ever used Google Maps, they have that capacity of zooming in close or zooming out to a larger view. So if you imagine zooming back out from the United States until you're seeing the entire globe and asking yourself, okay, what's going on in world history at different phases of our history as a faith community? And where do we fit into those larger stories of world history? It becomes a different way of thinking about our global history. And I've been trying that. So I've been using so far the same periodization, that is to say, chopping up the story into the same chronological units that Mark Schur uses in his book, uh, his trilogy, Journey of a People. He uses 1820 to 1844, 1844 to 1946, and then 1946 to the present. He chose that periodization because it corresponds to certain major shifts in the leadership of the church. So Joseph Smith Jr. dies in 1844. Uh, Fred M. Smith dies in 18, 1946. I've been using those same periodizations, but instead of thinking in terms of like what was happening in church leadership during those periods, I've been thinking about what's happening in world history during those periods. So if we think of 1820 to 1844 as the first phase of our story in Community of Christ, What's happening in world history during that time? Well, it's a time when there's a lot of political revolution going on in Latin America and in Europe. So a lot of political turmoil, a lot of movements toward creating more democratic styles of government. There's anti-slavery movements were quickly on the rise during that period, um, which would have huge ramifications for the millions of black people who had been taken from Africa in earlier centuries into various parts of the Americas, including the US, the Caribbean, Brazil. The Industrial Revolution was getting underway during this period, rapidly transforming British society, beginning to transform American society. Eventually, of course, we go on and transform the whole world. Along with the Industrial Revolution, you have the rise of industrial capitalism. And you also begin to have the rise of movements opposing capitalism, so the beginning of socialist and communist movements. And during this period, you have Western countries like the US, Britain, France, expanding their commercial activities into parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands. So if that's the story or the stories of what's going on in world history in 1820 to 1844, as a historian, I find myself wondering this. So in that context, what was God trying to accomplish in the world through us in 1820 and 1844? Or maybe another way of thinking about this, if this is the world context in which we existed as a faith community in that period, how were we responding to those situations as disciples of Christ? That's a story to start thinking about. I can do the same thing then as I move on through the later periods. 1844 to 1946 is a time when Western nations, Europe, um, I'm sorry, England, France, Germany, uh, Belgium, the United States begin colonizing the American West, or they finish colonizing the American West. They colonize most of Africa, large parts of Asia, the Pacific Islands. By the time you get to 1914, 85% of the world's land mass either consisted of European countries or the colonies of those countries, or the former colonies of those countries. This had a major impact on the societies that these places are colonizing. Those societies start to become modernized. They also start experiencing big surges of Christian missionary activity. Competition between these various empires will eventually culminate in two very bloody world wars, which will have a big impact on the future shape of the world politically. And this is also a period where there's a lot of immigration happening from Europe into other parts of the world, from China into other parts of the world. And this movement of people creates new kinds of conflicts, including labor conflicts. Uh, we see communism rise to become an important world power during this period. Again, I'm asking myself, okay, if that's the story of world history during this period, what was God trying to accomplish through us in the world during that period? Or how were we in Community of Christ or the reorganization responding to these world realities as disciples of Jesus Christ? Finally, 1946 to the present. After the Second World War, those big empires that the Europeans had created in the previous era all fall apart. The countries that compose them begin to become independent, sometimes peacefully, sometimes through violent revolution. The political map is radically reshaped. As part of that process, um, there becomes a pretty solid worldwide consensus that racism is a bad thing, although exactly how to combat it remains contested. 
it's an era of conflict, the Cold War for about 50 years, uh, various kinds of ethnic and religious conflicts being waged now with modern weaponry. It's a time of globalization, technology, communication, transportation, makes the world a much smaller place. Uh, there's a global economy. You can, products can be moved very quickly from one country to another. That begins to shape the lives of people all over the world. And at the same time, it's a time of new environmental threats. This is the era that we're still living in. And again, I ask myself, so if this is the story of world history, what is God trying to accomplish through this little faith community called Community of Christ during this period? Or how is it that we in Community of Christ, living now in various parts of the world, how is it that we are confronting these realities as disciples of Jesus? That would be one way to start thinking about a global history. When I zoom back from the U.S. to look at the larger world as a historian, I start to notice that there are certain themes that affect members of Community of Christ outside the U.S. more than inside the U.S. One of those is living through war. The United States has not experienced war on its own soil since the end of the 1800s when the last Indian wars were fought. We have, of course, sent people off to fight in wars elsewhere, um, which is a very you know, important experience, a horrific experience in many cases for those who experience that. But at home, we have not watched our cities reduced to rubble. We have not seen large numbers of Americans roaming the land as war refugees. We haven't experienced that dimension of war. But there are plenty of people in our faith community who have experienced that in the 20th and 21st centuries. And you see here on the map these various little dots uh, where I'm indicating places where this has happened. In the 1940s, uh, various members of the church in Holland were conscripted as forced labor into Germany and then had to find their way back after the war to their homes with the aid of our LDS members they met on the way. In the 1960s, uh, the civil war in Nigeria cut a whole brand new group of members of the RLDS church there off from the rest of the world. In the 1980s, members of the RLDS church encountered civil war in the Philippines, in Liberia, um, in Guatemala. In the 2000s, 3,000 members of the church in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia were affected by civil war. Many ended up in refugee camps. In the 2010s, uh, members of our church encountered, lived through war in the Ivory Coast and in Ukraine. I'd like to know more about those stories. I would like to see those kinds of stories, the stories of people who are living through war, trying to help their families survive through war, at the same time trying to live as disciples of Jesus in these very conf you know, conf conflict-driven areas. I would like to know more about those stories. Um, I would like to see those stories become more prominent in our own shared collective memory as a church. I would like to know what lessons we can learn as a church from the experiences of those of us, us in the sense of our global community who have lived through war. As I zoom out, I can also start thinking about ways to bring new perspective to stories that are more familiar. So for example, women's ordination. I've usually seen that story recounted with an emphasis on the debate in the United States, what Americans were thinking about it, um, the large numbers of members of the church in the U.S. who left over this issue. So I've always understood it as a U.S.-centered story. And again, there are logical reasons for that. Most of the church's membership has always been located in the U.S. But as I've begun researching this book, I've been able to find little bits and pieces of the story at an international level. I'd like to take a stab at trying to weave that together into a short account of the women's ordination debate in international perspective. So for example, um, the question of women's ordination began to be thought about by church leaders in the US for the first time, in part because of their encounters with groups elsewhere in the world, like the Igbo in Africa or the Orisha in India, where Something like a man baptizing a woman could be potentially problematic given the way that that ethnic group thought about modest relationships between men and women. And so some church leaders began to wonder if it might be possible to put women in positions where they could minister to other women. 
this interesting story of someone in Liberia, a woman who joined the church. She had been a minister in her church before that and was rather dismayed to find that once she joined the then RLDS church, she was no longer able to exercise her gifts in that fashion. And she and her husband actually ended up leaving the church for a time over it and then made a returning. I had not realized until I began doing some more research on this subject that in 1980, the church members in New Zealand, the, the New Zealand National Church, submitted a resolution to the World Conference that would have allowed national churches in consultation with the First Presidency to make their own decisions about ordaining women, which did not happen, but it was quite intriguing to me as a sort of foreshadowing of the arrangement that the church finally accepted as a result of Doctrine and Covenants 164. Um, I've seen references to the fact that by December of 1985, so a year after the revelation, uh, women had been ordained in the USA, Australia, Canada, the British Isles, Nigeria. The photo you're seeing here comes from the Herald and shows the ordination of the first woman in South America, Rosa Marques. I'm curious to know more about whether women's ordination was more slowly accepted in certain parts of our global family. I'm aware, of course, of the schism that occurred in the US over this issue. Did we lose significant numbers of members in other parts of the world over this issue? I don't know that. And I would be curious to know more about that as a way of thinking about this part of our history in global perspective. Another guiding principle that I've been developing is the idea of highlighting multi-ethnicity and internationalization. I, I, I cringe, I realize how very academic those multisyllabic words were. Those multisyllabic words look, even the word multisyllabic is multisyllabic. But here's what I mean by that in perhaps simpler language. We, of course, have always been a predominantly white American movement. The majority of our members have always been, still are, white Americans. Of course, that majority has shrunk over time as more and more members of other nationalities and other ethnicities have been drawn into our movement. But despite the fact that we've always been predominantly white American, it is also true that from the beginning of the movement, God has been bringing people of different nationalities and ethnicities into the movement. So, when we talk about the early history of the Restoration, a common way to represent that visually is with a map like this, where we see the, you know, the shifting headquarters of the church moving across the northeastern portion of the United States. This is a map that comes from Mark Schur's book. But if we pull back to the global view, this is another way we could map the early Latter-day Saint movement in the period from 1820 to 1844. So uh, the oval that you see in the middle of the North American continent represents, if I can back up for a second, this. So that oval represents the migration west of the church's headquarters. So think of it as the center place, kind of elongated. But the other lines and dots you see represent efforts that our community was making, quite ambitious efforts, I would point out, to take our community and make it international. So missions to the Indian Territory, missions to Canada, missions to Britain, a mission to Palestine, a mission from Britain to Australia, a mission from the United States to French Polynesia. This was all happening within that first period. Of course, you lose sight of that if this is your mental picture of the early stage of our movement. I'd like us to think more about this as the picture of our movement. And in addition to expanding across national borders, the movement was, again, overwhelmingly white American or overwhelmingly white people of British descent, including people from Canada and the British Isles. But even so, from the beginning, there was an element of multi-ethnicity. God was bringing other people into the movement. David Whitmer, a German American. Jane Manning, an African American. Louis Dana, a Native American of the Oneida Nation. Tehenari, a Polynesian woman who greeted the first missionaries uh, who arrived in what is now French Polynesia. I know something about most of these people, less about Tehenari than the others. I would like to know more about these people. In a story about Community of Christ as a global family, I propose that these people should loom larger in our memory. I've been compiling other sorts of landmarks of the church's gradual diversification as we've grown. So for example, the first, first presidency 
composed entirely of people not born in the US was in the year 2000. I had not known that until I began researching this book. I wish I had. It seems like that should be an important landmark that I should be carrying in my head as part of the story of who we are. This was interesting to discover. This is 1973. Uh, you see Etienne Vana uh, to the left, who had been appointed the mission president in Tahiti. And this is his, his, this is his, his, uh, his mission presidency. So those are his counselors there. Alan Breckeridge in the middle, who was an American, and Jean Boussou, who was French. Uh, this was, as you can see in the caption, believed to be the only international and trilingual mission presidency in the church. That's, I think, an important landmark for us in becoming a global family. I love this photo. This was taken in uh, 2000. It shows, I don't, know if they're, I don't know if they're the very first, but they're certainly some of the first people from outside the U.S. who served in World Service Corps. They came to the U.S. from Korea, um, I believe Nigeria, the, no, I'm sorry, Kenya, from Korea, Kenya, the Philippines, and French Polynesia. And what I like about this picture is it's not only, of course, you know, racially and nationally diverse, but they also represent four different generations in the church. So the woman you see to the far left, Ju, uh, Ju Kyung Han from Korea, was a convert, so first generation member. Eva Wasonga from Kenya, who you see to the far right, was a second generation member. Uh, Jennifer de Guzman from the Philippines, who's sitting, was a third generation. And then Fanny Ludwig Tuara was a fourth generation member from French Polynesia. And I think it's a useful reminder that by the time you get to 2001, there are fourth generation members of the church in French Polynesia as a reminder of the diversity that has been present with us from early in our history. A particularly interesting study in the forging of an international community is the Mexico, Texas Mission Center, which was deliberately created in order to preserve cross-border relationships that developed in the decades leading up to our shift from stakes to mission centers. Uh, you can see obviously with the dots, uh, congregations um, in the upper portion of the map, they're, on they're in Texas and over in Saltillo, you see a congregation in Mexico. I think this is a really interesting story. And at a time where right now, the US-Mexico border is becoming increasingly politicized and militarized and more closely you know, shut off. Um, I'm very curious to know more about how this mission center is dealing with the challenge of remaining one in Christ across an increasingly policed border. Um, and their desire to do so, I think, is, is something very admirable. Again, this is something I would like to loom larger in our shared uh, memory as a church. Now, it should be pointed out that the diversity of the church should not be understood as an occasion for self-congratulation. Um, there is the risk of tokenism here, um, a mostly white body picking the relatively few people of color in it, holding them up, saying, look, 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 we're diverse. That would not be a very good way of handling our history. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that as the church becomes more ethnically and racially diverse, that creates all kinds of new challenges. It creates new opportunities for friction, for racism. And those are things that we as a community have to learn how to navigate, whether it's the tension between white Americans and African Americans, or the Efik and the Igbo in Nigeria, who ended up on opposite sides of a civil war. And at one point in our history, wanted to have separate missions because of it, though the church did not allow that. Tensions between Japanese and Koreans. Um, there is still a lot of resentment in Korea over the fact that uh, Japan uh, conquered Korea during World War II. There was an interesting story I encountered when Grant McMurray visited Japan. He went to the, um, the Atomic War Memorial in Hiroshima and made a kind of an apology to the Japanese for you know, the role that the U.S. government had, you know, the, for the U.S. government having dropped the bomb. And that was not well received by members of the church in Korea. Uh, there was some complaining about why is he apologizing to the Japanese? Where's the Japanese apology for how we have been treated? Those kinds of national tensions um, become more and more common as the church becomes more and more diverse nationally. I'm looking at the time. I end up having more material than I really had time to get through. So let me go ahead and fast forward to the end here. I, well, let me, let me talk about this. This is the last thing I'll talk about. 
one of the principles I've been thinking about is how to highlight alternatives to stories where things move from the center out. I talked about that model and how it's a problematic model because of the power imbalance embedded in the relationship between the center and the margins. But it is a realistic model for describing some of the ways in which God has drawn people from different nations into our community. One of the ways that the church has moved into other countries is because people, missionaries, um, people involved in charitable work, uh, sometimes military personnel or people working for governments or private firms, leave the U.S., go to other countries, establish the church there. People in those countries start to be drawn into the community. That's one way it happens. But I'm really intrigued by the other kinds of stories we can tell. So all the different kinds of stories where it works the other direction, where church headquarters is contacted out of the blue by people who have somehow managed to encounter the church via literature or nowadays online and reach out to headquarters to say, hey, we would be interested in affiliating with you and becoming part of this, this international body. Those stories I find very interesting. There are all kinds of stories as well that don't really involve the center at all, neither moving out nor going in. It's stories about how people in one part of the world take the church into another part of the world without the intervention of the center. Um, I love the complexity of those stories as well. And when you put it all together, what you come up with is, again, what I like to imagine is a kind of weaving together. I look at this, this, this map with things going out from the center and things coming into the center and other kinds of connections being drawn that don't involve the center. And it looks like a very complicated kind of weaving, a literal weaving together of different nations into a single community. That's an image I'm trying to keep in mind and trying to figure out how to tell as a story. So let me finish with this. As I move forward trying to figure out how to create a story of community of Christ as a global family, I guess it boils down to three things for me. I think it's a story about the various ways that God has drawn people together from different nations, races, and ethnicities, and the challenges that creates for us as a community, learning how to live together and be one people in Jesus Christ. Learning to embody oneness and equality in Christ is a challenge for us as a global community, and I think sometimes we've done it well, and sometimes we have not done it well. And that needs to become part of the story we tell about ourselves. And finally, I think it's a story about people from different countries working together to carry out Christ's mission in the various places around the world where we happen to be. Somehow I want to figure out how to tell a story about all of that, a story that is simple enough, we can carry it in our heads, but complex enough to reflect the complexities and the, the challenges embedded in that kind of story. Maybe if we behave ourselves, you'll be willing to go back to those parts that you skipped. It would look like some pretty if you saw things on slides that you'd like me to go back and look at, we can do that. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep that in mind. Oh, well, was there something in particular you were interested in, Bart? Just getting- Something that flashed by? Um, well, I thought I saw the um, Evanelia. You did see the Evanelia. Let me see if I can get back to that. Yeah, so one of the things that, I, one of my guiding principles that I didn't talk about is uh, trying to find alternatives to white savior stories. White savior is a term that has come to be used, it's a critical term, and it's applied to missionaries, uh, to white missionaries in particular, who go into other countries, uh, particularly dealing with non-white people, um, and it, the term is a, is a way of critically describing an attitude where white missionaries may feel like they have the answers. They know how to solve everyone's problems. Um, and this is something that people who do missions these days are kind of critically conscious of. And so I'm interested in the Evanelia story as a potential white savior story that however could be understood differently. If I can get it to open up, there we go. Um, so the Evanelia, the, the mission boat uh, created around the turn of the, from the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, the idea was that it would provide the missionaries in French Polynesia with a way of moving more easily from island to island. And the money was raised by Americans, so predominantly white. Um, and it was certainly a very generous thing that the Americans did. The boat was created here in the U.S. and then sent to French Polynesia, where it functioned for a while. And then it turned out that it had not been well designed for the kinds of waters it would be moving through, and it eventually broke apart and sank. When that happened, Meduore, who was the bishop of French Polynesia, 
I wrote a letter to church leaders complaining about the fact that they had not consulted with Polynesian shipbuilders or used Polynesian shipbuilders to create the boat. He felt that they would have you know, known better how to create it in a way that would that would have survived. And so for me, the story of the Evanalia, while it's a story about you know, the generosity of people in one country wanting to help another country, it's also, I think, a cautionary tale about what happens when the dominant group presume that they know what the answer is and they don't consult the expertise of local people. The Evanalia is a story where we failed to do that. But there are other stories in our history where the dominant group learned to do that. So when Outreach International is created, for example, or when Sherry Kirkpatrick starts creating her health ministries, their model is um, it's not white people coming in and claiming to know the answers. I mean, the white people involved in creating these programs, they have certain kinds of resources and, and access to travel and so on, which allows them to do things that locals can't do. But the goal is always to partner with local people, to consult with local people. So it's the outsiders not coming in and presuming to know the answers. It's the outsiders coming in, talking with locals, figuring out together what the solution is, and then leveraging resources to do it. And so I think that's a case where we as a community learned to do better at being a global family and where the dominant folks, the white folks in this case, learned to listen to other people. That's where I was going with that. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close tonight, John Charles? No, this was a lot of fun. I hope people found it useful. I. I, I didn't know going into it if this presentation was going to be very, I don't know, abstract and it was very meta, right? We're not telling a story. We're talking about how to tell stories. I wasn't sure people would find that useful or interesting. I hope that they did. I think it was absolutely fascinating. And if anything, we're walking away understanding the challenge of having a, a global narrative or a global history. Uh, but I'm so glad that you have stepped up and uh, taken on this challenge to write that history. We're all looking forward to that publication at the next World Conference. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, thank you, John Charles, for sharing with us tonight and for helping us officially launch the Church History Without Boundaries Autumn Lecture Series. You have truly set the stage for the other guest speakers in the Global History Series. Also, again, thank you to Megan and Peter for helping co-host tonight and for managing everything from behind the scenes. And lastly, we share a thanks to you, our friends in the audience, for your love of Community of Christ history and for generously supporting the Community of Christ historic sites with your generous donations. Thank you so much for your support. As I mentioned earlier, I'll encourage you to tune in next week as we explore the story behind Community of Christ in India with David Howlett. Um, Megan has already dropped a link to the Church History Without Lecture series. Church History Without Boundaries lecture series in the chat box. Follow that link to register for next week's program. Again, it's an evening you don't want to miss. So until next Thursday, take care everyone, keep reading your church history, and have a blessed night.